All right, Dale, we've been talking about a lot of different species of cover crops in this in this tour. Uh, but, but let's talk about mixes now because that's, that's really what we're all about. That's the whole goal. We only plant all those other things in a monoculture kind of to see what the plants look like. Uh, but, but this is the goal. This is what we want. We want this jungle-like effect where we're planting six, eight, ten, twenty, four species all together to bring about all the power of diversity. And of all the mixes that we sell and that we put together and that we do for people, this, this is one of my favorites because it's just, it's just so pretty. Uh, this is what we call our cool season pollinator mix. It's got uh, primarily cool season plants, so we could plant it in March or April. But look at all the different flowering plants. We've got different heights, we've got different flowering times, we've got different colors. Uh, there's, there's at least 8, 10, 12 different things in here right now that I can see blooming from right here. And some of this stuff has been blooming for probably five to six weeks. And some of this stuff will still be blooming a month from now. And so that's really the goal of a good pollinator mix is to stretch that bloom window out across as long a period as possible and have just absolute diversity. Uh, because, you know, insects don't like to eat just one thing, just like, you know, we don't want just one thing. We want the big buffet. Yeah. And, and some, some, uh, Pollinator species are very species specific, others are general in nature. Of course, honeybees will use a wide variety of plants. Bumblebees will use a wide variety of plants. Some of the lesser known pollinator species, the ones that tend to be more endangered, um, are more specific in their needs. So when you have a wide diversity like this, the odds of one of those plants meeting their needs is greatly enhanced. And of course, having diversity like this is good for all the reasons we like diversity. You, you really minimize your risk of any one thing um, failing on you. You've yeah. got something else to take the place. You've got layering of leaves, canopy, root systems, different plant families, different root exudates. And it, all these blends are just much more impressive than any of the monocultures. Right. And so where we would use something like this, you know, I wouldn't necessarily plant this across the whole 160 acres of, you know, where I want to cover crops. The, the value and the power of this is to plant strips along some of your production fields, uh, plant strips if you've got beehives, uh, but this will be an insectiary, if you will, a, a habitat for those beneficial insects. But the nice thing about this is, is we can put this out for, you know, $30, $35 an acre for something like this, as opposed to if you're trying to establish some perennial type plants, and there's a place for perennial pollinator strips, but you could spend $150 to $200 an acre pretty easily, and you may not see much established for three or four years. So this is where I want a pollinator strip, I want it fast, I want it relatively cheap, and I'm not necessarily going to have pollinators there next year. I'm going to move it to another spot. And that's where this really has a good fit, this, this type of application. You know, and, and when a lot of times when farmers hear the word pollinators, and, oh, that's for the bee and butterfly people. It is. But it's also, um, I, I noticed that it's hard to tell with the wind blowing around, there's a surfeit fly here. And, and surfeit flies are voracious, the larvae of surfeit flies are voracious aphid predators. They eat a lot of aphids and there'll be ladybugs and lacewings in here. Pollen and nectar is not just for bees and butterflies. It's also for ladybugs and lacewings and other predatory insects that can build up populations here and then move into our crop when aphids show up. Yeah. And so having a strip of this around a, a, an aphid susceptible crop, whether that's uh, uh, sorghum or you know whatever crop is affected by aphids, cowpeas. Um, this can build up the predator populations to give you some really cheap biological control of those things. You, you know, and another thing, Dale, is that we oftentimes think, you know, when we're growing corn and soybeans, that we don't really need pollen. They're self-pollinating. You know, we don't need that. But I've seen studies. I don't know if it was Iowa State maybe came out with a study with soybeans where there was ample populations of pollinator insects, they saw a 15 to 20 percent yield increase in soybeans, a crop that we never think about needing native pollinators uh, to yeah. help with our yield. And, uh, and but I think it's there. Yeah, no, a lot of crops don't need 
pollination. Uh, they're self-pollinated, but they can benefit yeah. from pollination, cross-pollination. Sunflowers are a great example. If you have no bees, you will still get sunflowers. But if you have bees, you can get about a 25% yield yeah. And so it, it's very beneficial to have pollinating insects, even for some of the crops that we don't think about.